Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so it's my preschooler's graduation, so I must be there. She's been practicing this. It's a small world, after all, for like four weeks. Um, so if you've been in the Bay Area over the last several years, you know that global environmental change impacts are happening. Droughts, wildfires, heat waves. And we know that these sorts of impacts are expected to intensify in dramatic, unpredictable, and sometimes violent ways in the future. And it's going to affect the lives and livelihoods of people not only in the Bay Area, but also around the world. In October 2017, I was walking down the street with my husband and my two-year-old daughter. And it was like any other Saturday, except we were wearing N95 masks. So my husband and I were wearing N95 masks, which at that time, it wasn't, it was actually rather unusual to be doing that. But my daughter wasn't wearing a mask. North of us, a fire was blazing, was raging. This was the Tubbs fire. And the winds that had brought the smoke down to the San Francisco Bay Area at that point in time had abated, leaving behind a thick cloud of smoke that hugged the ground, making it not only difficult to see, but to breathe when we were outside. And so I knew that wildfire smoke exposure was bad, but I wasn't sure what was worse, chronic exposure or an acute exposure during these types of events. And at any rate, we had to leave the house. We had to go to a baby shower. And for the life of me, I could not find a mask that fit my daughter's face. So we were walking down the street when a car slowed down. The driver leaned out of the window and started screaming expletives at us, accusing us, accusing me of being a bad parent, of putting my child's health in danger. I stood there, trembling with anger and with shame. So we have all had these moments where we are faced with risks that we haven't encountered before. We don't know what to do about it. We're not really quite sure how to protect ourselves, how to protect our children. And this was you know, one of those moments for me. So I was you know, ashamed and angry. Um, I was shaken, but also at that moment, I felt motivated. And when we think about global environmental change, undoubtedly, we need to take steps to mitigate. But a lot of that change is already locked in. It's already happening. And so we, as individuals, as communities, as a society, need to take steps to account for, to accommodate, to avoid, in short, to adapt to the change that is happening. And we need to adapt in ways that are sustainable so we don't continue to contribute to the problem, but also in ways that can be sustained. My group really seeks to understand impacts, responses, and outcomes as it relates to global environmental change. We seek to identify and develop interventions to help affect responses to improve outcomes we may care about, such as those related to health. We often do this in the context of exposure to extremes, so extreme weather events as an example. And one type of extreme weather event that, is, uh, that a lot of people are experiencing are uh, ex uh, repeated exposures to hurricanes or tropical cyclones. And one question in my field is, what are the impacts of this repeated exposure to these types of extreme events on health? And one way that we have done this is by conducting longitudinal, these are long-term studies, where we follow the same cohort of individuals over time. We've done this in a large-scale study in the US Gulf Coast with a representative sample of individuals. And in this particular study, we have found, um, where we have focused on the Florida cohort of this panel study that we have, repeated exposure to hurricanes is associated with an increase in mental health symptoms. And exposure can take form in 
multiple ways. So you can be directly exposed, so the event has happened to me. Exposure can also be indirect. It's happening to somebody that I know. And exposure can actually be through media, so watching it on television. What the findings suggest is that we are not becoming acclimated to exposure to these repeated events. And this represents a growing mental health crisis. When we think about what we need to do, given the, the number of people, the growing number of people that are exposed to these types of repeated events, is we need to provide appropriate mental health support before, during, and after events occur. When unexpected and bad things happen, we have a natural tendency to try to figure out what caused it so that we can figure out what to do next time, so how to reduce that risk next time. What is the appropriate response? In the context of global environmental change, when we do this, we may attribute it potentially to climate change, for example. And this is really important. This is called attribution. Attribution helps to direct our behavior. And in studies that we have done, we have found that when people attribute an extreme weather event that they've experienced to climate change, they are more likely to adapt as well as to mitigate. One thing that we don't know that much about is how repeated exposures and actual exposures are eliciting um, this kind of attribution response. So again, looking at this in the context of the longitudinal study that we have in the US Gulf Coast, and this time looking uh, at a larger set of our cohort where we're looking at people in Florida as well as people in Texas, so this is about 2,700 people, we're finding that when people are actually exposed to these repeated events, it's resulting in this bifurcation in terms of how people are attributing their experience to climate change, where about a third of our cohort are saying, the experience of this, of this hurricane event, I'm attributing it to climate change. It's made worse because of climate change. Whereas another third are saying this has nothing to do with climate change. In the absence of hurricane activity, we see differences in what are called subjective attributions, these types of attributions essentially disappearing. So this has implications because we often think about these events as being windows of opportunity when we're gonna engage and talk to people about climate change, helping them to make that link between extreme events and climate change. And we see in other studies that that's actually important for directing behavior. What this means is that we need to not have the same message for all audiences, and we need to also think about the timing of when we talk to people. Millions of people every year are displaced by floods, and many more are going to be displaced in the future because of climate change, sea level rise as an example. And communities and governments are grappling, thinking about what can we do, how can we help people? How can we help our communities? And one rather extreme version of adaptation is planned relocation, where you move whole communities from areas that are at high risk of exposure, in this case flooding, to lower risks of exposure. However, there's evidence that suggests that planned relocation, so displaced individuals or relocated individuals, can experience poor outcomes in their new location, marginalization, food insecurity, unemployment. So planned relocation has the power to be transformative, but we also need to think about what are the planning decisions um, that go around planned relocation. And not that much is known about how planning decisions for planned relocation are associated with sustainability livelihood outcomes that we may care about such as social, economic, or cultural assets. In a comparative study that we did looking at 14 cases around the world, looking at planned relocation in the context of flooding, we found that having high levels of community engagement was associated with positive outcomes, and that it differed depending on the size of the communities. So for large communities, larger communities, 
engagement plus a shorter time scale for movement led to better outcomes. And for smaller scale communities, engagement plus a longer time for the movement where households are moving together resulted in more positive outcomes. And planned relocation processes are often fraught and obviously not gonna be the solution that is appropriate in all contexts. So it's really important that we do this carefully so that communities are not left worse off than they were before. So it is rarely the case that impacts, responses, and outcomes follow this linear trajectory, this kind of unidirectional path. But rather, responses and outcomes, um, there are feedbacks and interactions. And this is a very dynamic system. And this is a conceptual framework that my group uses, which we call a dynamic model of behavior change. And the types of studies that we do where we follow cohorts of individuals over time really allow us to look at this dynamism, this kind of dynamic interaction. So for example, in areas where we're seeing repeated exposure to extreme events, when people are taking steps to adapt, they may fail to uh, consider that these types of extreme events may be intensifying in the future. And in fact, when we look at that Gulf Coast study that we were, we're working um, on, which we've been conducting since 2017, I can't believe how long we've been working in the Gulf Coast, but um, what we have found is that the more people adapt, the lower their perceived risks over time, even if they're living in regions that are experiencing or are expected to experience intensifying storm events. So frontline communities are those communities that experience the first and worst uh, impacts from climate change. And in these particular communities, they tend to be underserved and historically marginalized. And they tend to have fewer resources or assets available to them to adapt in ways that are sustainable, let alone to adapt in sustained ways. And in one project that we're doing, where we're really working and engaging with community partners and frontline communities, helps us understand what those impacts are in frontline communities as it relates to exposure to extreme events. And we're, we're doing this project in the Bay Area. It's called Our Communities, Our Bay, where we're following a cohort of 300 households as they're experiencing extreme events, such as wildfire smoke events, floods, heat waves. And within this context, we're working with community partners and our communities to identify and test different low-cost, affordable interventions to reduce exposure, such as message, risk message-based interventions using air purifiers or air cleaners. And we're assessing how that actually reduces exposure and improves outcomes we care about, such as those related to health. And we're using a variety of techniques to actually figure out what is the exposure, using sensors both inside and outside the home, as well as using sensors to assess health outcomes, such as sleep mats. Um, and I can tell you more about them because we actually have to put them under people's beds, like between the mattress and the box spring, which is kind of tricky to do. Um, but we also have uh, an app that we use. It's called the Our Communities app which allows us to provide authoritative scientific information about the risks people face with respect to extreme events. It also allows us to provide them with the data that we're gathering from all of the sensors that we're outfitting um, our households with. And it also offers an opportunity for us to push surveys out in real time such that we're able to ascertain what people are thinking, doing, and feeling as these events unfold. And this particular project allows us to ask a lot of different questions and to uncover what is happening inside people's homes. How are they protecting themselves? How are they not protecting themselves? How are they behaving? And in one small pilot project that we did, uh, study that we did within this project, was to look at indoor air quality exposure. And what we found is that in our frontline households, their indoor air quality was worse in the absence of wildfire events, let me just say that, than the outdoor average air quality during the historic 2020 wildfire season. And furthermore, it was worse and more variable than households that were similar in their neighborhood, as well as affluent households in adjacent neighborhoods. 
This suggests that we need to do better in terms of understanding what is happening inside frontline community households and surveying households to understand what their behaviors are and designing better policies that take these communities into account so that we're not leaving anybody behind. So clearly, global environmental change is happening. The impacts are here. We must adapt. We must mitigate. We must also address those institutional and social structures that are in place that contribute to the crises of sustainability and vulnerability. We must do that. And the Dura School Sustainability and the students we have here and the faculty we have here and the staff we have here is really going to be the engine that kind of drives identifying those solutions in the way that makes sense, that are appropriate, so that we as a society can more nimbly adapt to the change that we're seeing now and the change that we expect to see in the future. Thank you.